I got give me permission to record. Yes. I'm gonna ask him. You have to give me permission to record. Well, they did. For some reason, it's still not letting me. Oh, well, whatever. Figure it out later. Okay. This is still playing. Mm -hmm. I can't hear anything. I know why. What did I? What did I not do in all of that? Share your audio. Share my audio. See, I'm going to share my screen again. I go back and and. Fix that. No, okay, there we go. <laughs> can you hear me now? I can hear you fine. All right, so welcome to another edition of Think with a Drink. It's the weekly webinar series brought to you by the Aries Foundation for Financial Education. And this week we're doing, because we've been getting this a lot with everything that's going on with the housing and mortgage rates and all that stuff. Craig and I have been getting a lot of questions from people who are thinking about buying a home. And the question is, should I do that now or should I wait? And that's really what we're going to go through this week. So real quick, as, as we just go, so just know we're recording this because we share this on our website. We share it on our YouTube channel. Uh, just keep your microphones muted. You just know that what's only what's being shown on the screen is what is being, so your cameras can stay off. That's fine. There is a chat box. Please make use of the chat box if you have any questions. My co-pilot, Craig, who is with me here, and I'll introduce in a second, is here to make sure to answer any of those questions or to make sure that we don't get off pace in terms of the evening's flight. <laughs> Speaking of your pilots for tonight's journey, my name is Tom Alessi. I have been in financial services for now. I'm in my 24th year. I'm an investment advisor. That means I act as a fiduciary whenever giving guidance or advice. And I'd like to bring my vice president, Craig, if you could introduce yourself, please. Sure. So I'm Craig Richardson. I'm the vice president of the Aries Foundation. Uh, I've been doing this a little over 18 years now in financial services, and I specialize in working with families to help them to find their financial goals and have a better relationship with their money. And Craig will be chiming in as we go along, but like we said, he's also there in case anything pops up in the chat rocks. Uh, we told you that Think With a Drink is brought to you by the Aries Foundation for Financial Education. You can visit our website. It's www.ariesfoundation.org. We're a nonprofit dedicated to the mission, trying to help everyone have a better relationship with their money, because whether you realize it or not, you are in a relationship with money. And just like every other personal relationship that you have, there are behaviors and triggers that cause us to act irrationally sometimes when it comes to our money and our finances. That's all that Craig, myself, the rest of the Aries team tries to do is help everybody take a step back maybe get through a little bit of the why this is occurring and some of the steps that you can take to try to have a better relationship with your money. So the next page has a lot of words on it. These are disclosures. Just know we're a nonprofit. We do this for educational and informational purposes. All we ask is that if you're going to share this information, that you do it in an educational manner. However, Craig, myself, the rest of the Aries team always recommends that if you ever have questions of a financial, legal, or tax nature, that you seek out the help of a professional. <laughs> I got through the long part. Now we get to the fun part of the evening. We call this think with a drink because we know some of these, Craig, right? These can be a little bit challenging, a little bit intimidating for some folks. Mm -hmm. So our thought was, let's try to make it a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more casual, a little friendly, if you will. And we couldn't think of a better way to do that than if we had something cold to sip on while we're doing it. And I am drinking, this is called, I am so excited for this, Summon the Queen from oh Medusa God. Brewery. Uh, <laughs> it is a, 
a milk stout with coffee and chocolate. And, uh, you know, I just figured, right, the, the episode's about a home, right? And a home is your castle. So I figured summon the queen, right? Why not have something that's a little bit of royalty in it? What are you drinking? So I have my glass here from the, I got in the Shenandoah Valley. However, the wine I'm drinking is actually from Taylor Brook Winery, which is down here in Woodstock, Connecticut. And it's a mix of red and white grapes. It's actually a sunny sangria. So I'm drinking a wine tonight. Dry wine. Very nice. All right. I'm off to summon the queen. Let's see what happens. Okay. That was good. All right. I'm getting, I'm getting a little bit of the coffee. I'm not getting too much on the chocolate. I'm getting some of the coffee, though. I can definitely taste that, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think with a milk stout, there's not much you would really serve as far as food pairing is concerned, maybe desserts. Okay. Um, one off the wall for the folks out there is if you do have something like this or that heavy like chocolate milk stout type of thing, mm -hmm. maybe like Mexican, it almost will offset some of that heavy, you know, especially the spicier Mexican type stuff. Ask, yeah, act almost, type like, thing. <laughs> almost yeah i'm almost out like act like a mole type of thing with it you know so it's sort of balancing off the the spice with a little bit of sweet a little bit of chocolate a there little bit go. of the zing there so that's something to think about with it otherwise like i said medusa they're in framingham and this is summon the queen will you tell me how your taco tuesday goes with this next week <laughs> that's a good idea look at you see there we go summon the queen for taco tuesday Mm -hmm. All right. So the agenda for this evening, uh, you know, thinking about buying a home, we're going to talk about what's gone on with the housing market, sort of how it got here, why it's here, what's happening right now. If you're renting or thinking about renting or still renting, you know, some of the considerations with that, why that might make sense. Mm -hmm. The interest rate, recession risks, you know, sort of pulling that in with the factors. It's not five factors to consider. It's only I think it's three. Um, as far as that's concerned, but some factors to be thinking about as we look at where housing is going, what's happening with it and things to consider there. And then, you know, a little bit about us at the end. Okay. So, you know, looking at, at sort of what happened with the pandemic, the, the housing market is on fire or en fuego, as I say, see, I'm trying to stay with the whole spicy Mexican thing. Look, I didn't even know that. Look at the tie in there. The housing market was en fuego, right? You know, so so what happened? What caused it? Right. So certainly the whole idea of those the, the mortgage rates, you know, getting dropping the 30 year fixed, getting all the way down into the, the low. I think at one point it almost got under three. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You yeah. know, so your fixed, right. I, I think there was a point where it did drop under three. But I mean, for a, I know a year ago it was at three point one three. You wow. know, so so, you know, it's it's the number was incredibly low, which made housing so much more affordable or the ability to think about taking on a mortgage from that affordability standpoint. Right. Then you had the great migration. Suddenly it wasn't hip or cool to be in the city anymore with pandemic going on. It was more cool to be out in the suburbs and away from people. So you had sort of this whole migration of people looking to not be in the condo in the city and wanting to be in the single home in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. This, uh, again, more of that, that sort of housing, what was happening with it. And then the Fed kept adding the stimulus. So the housing market was just, just shooting up off of this. Right. It's just, just becoming, you know, uh, some of this frenzy that occurred, especially last year, like, like the stories, Craig, with people paying, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of dollars above asking in a bidding war. Well, the, the issue with that wasn't just because the demand for housing went up. The inventory wasn't there. There wasn't enough inventory to support it. And so people were buying houses sight unseen and dropping as you know dropping money on a way above the asking prices so really became this like total seller's market right yeah and that's that's what so that's where housing was a year ago right we were we were in this 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 just shooting straight up thing mm -hmm. you know today it's a little bit different right <laughs> so 
it's it's not quite in this this trajectory down that that we've showing there in terms of a, a total flame out, but certainly what the Fed has done, and we'll talk about the interest rates and where those are in, in later, but mm -hmm. that whole tightening process, you know, one of the first areas that's that's being hit and certainly was hit is housing because the 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 mortgages, the mortgage rates have gone up because the the property values are starting to come down. What you're seeing is a housing market in decline. And that's affecting a lot of things that go along with it. But for the idea of home buying, like you talked about, Craig, buying stuff sight unseen or throwing, you know, 40, 50,000 extra at a property, mm -hmm. that's not going to happen now. That's that, those days are gone at this point because you're not going to uh -oh. see that. The only reason you're going to see might see some of that on occasion is because, you know, single family properties, like you said, that people want, especially, you know, the baby boomers who are downsizing, you know, they want those, those ranch type properties, you know, one levels, the demand is still high and their inventory is still very low. So on those particular properties, you may still see some of that. I, you know, I'm, I want to, I might overbid, but. Okay. Yeah, Cause it's the place I want to be. It's the, the, my, the location I'm looking for the property I'm looking for that sort of my sweet spot, right? The demand is high for that particular type of property and there's not enough inventory. So no, and I agree with you on that. Like when you think of it from that perspective of, especially for those, like you're talking about say boomers or people who are now, this is where I'm going to retire. This is where I'm going to age in place. Cause that's what I want to do. So this is the place I've got to have to do that. And a lot of times, you know, you may be a little less um, uh, affected by price on your last property than you were in your first property. Right? Yeah. Because you got a little more to work with. You may be selling a property. It's, it's and having exciting. something to move into, right? Yeah, right. this is more on the people who are looking at, at the first time buyer, right? So the first time buyer is really more of this, this, or I'm, I'm trying to upgrade from that starter home to the family right. home type of thing. And first and or second it purchase, in. right? Yep. There you go. This is, this is where that's more too. So, okay. So the, then we, we cross into, you know, should I consider renting instead or continue to rent type of thing? And, you know, there's four reasons really that, that somebody rents or continues to rent or will think about it for say the next year or so. Right. So, so generally it's, if you're already renting, it's affordability. It's it's you're renting within your range and it's something you're already doing. If you're if you're not renting, now this becomes a different conversation because well, can you afford it without bringing, you know, multiple multiple roommates into the equation who have to you got to live with and stay with type of thing. <laughs> it is flexible though, right? You're not tied down to one place, you're not tied down to one spot. You can freely go to someplace else, move to another part of the country type of thing where you're not worried about, gee, I have to sell this property in order to do that. Mm -hmm. So you do have that, that's even more of the great migration. I can go. Well, you I think, let, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think the other thing too is, you know, unlike when we were younger, you might start with a company and stay there for quite a while. I think you're seeing a lot of people who are moving from company to company, they're a little more transient, right? And that may mean not only different country, uh, company, but different parts of the country. I mean, right. working in New England, and maybe working in the, in the West Coast, and so while sometimes, you know, the, having the equity in a home is nice, but if, if you know every three or four years, you may be, you know, trying to climb that yeah, ladder. Go in someplace else in order to move up type of thing. Right. So you want to keep your options open. So you see a lot of that now. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the other side is, you know, for some people, it's less responsibility. But, you know, you're not, you know, for a lot of it, you're not doing the upkeep, the maintenance, the 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 mowing the grass type of thing that's all covered by somebody else. I don't have to worry about doing repairs and other stuff. Just changing you know, the occasional light bulb, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I don't have to think about painting or doing stuff, you know? So, so mm -hmm. there is that factor of it for like you talked about in a younger demographic where maybe, okay, I, I don't want to have that right now. I got too much other stuff on my plate to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, there's, there's the debt. <laughs> idea right so uh, we talk a lot craig and i about good debt versus bad debt you know and this is appreciating um uh, assets so it's usually good debt but it's still debt and it's a monthly number that has to be paid along with everything else that goes along with it and we'll talk about that in a little bit when we talk about those factors to consider 
So that mortgage plus those, you know, insurance and other payments that go along with that suddenly become a nut that you can't get out of. It's, just, it's like, I got to keep paying this thing. Well, I think the other thing too, Tom, I don't think you see, you see as drastic a flip as we did in 2008, 2009. Um, with interest rates going up and house costs going, you know, price of houses going down, could find yourself a little bit underwater on equity on some homes. And so in those types of, you know, you may be stuck in a property a little longer than you had planned on because right. you can't get out from under it. Right. Yeah. And you won't see that, like you said, you won't see that as much nowadays because you won't have that, the, you know, the, the free home thing, right? You know, you're still going to have to be putting money down. You know, you're not going to have this just because you're breathing. We're signing a, a, a you know, a, a loan to you type of thing, which was going on back then. Well, I think people were stuck in arms and the arms swung so far that now they couldn't afford the payments anymore. Right. Right. Well, but they were also putting very little down in some cases, no money down on right. properties. That, right. But if you're paying one percent and your appointments one and it goes from paying one percent interest to, say, eight, nine, ten. It doesn't matter what you put down or didn't put down, the payment's becoming right. affordable. And like I said, you can't sell it because the property on the market isn't worth what you paid for it originally. So right. just because the market swung. Once again, don't see that being as big a deal this time around, just because they kind of got a handle on some of those crazy mortgages. Correct. They put some of the, the restraints and restrictions yeah. in place and that type of thing. You know, so the other side of renting is, in, at least we're here and we're in Massachusetts, so we're, we're quoting you based off Massachusetts, just so you understand. But the average two-bedroom apartment in Massachusetts, monthly rent is seventeen hundred and fifteen dollars, one seven one five a month. So you know, you break that out, that's like eight seventy five a person type of thing, or something like that. Yeah, you get you get a uh, east of four ninety five. I'm sure it shoots up dramatically too. I mean, that's average yeah. date, but right. Right. Well, you, you start going into some, some, yes, like the greater Boston area, the metro. Four thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> you get into it. And especially if you try like a home or something like that, you're in a, this is just a two bedroom place, but right. you know, so just understand that's, that's one of the, the, the sort of, okay, I'm flexible. I can do this, but you, you know, it's just, you're paying the amount of what probably a mortgage payment might be depending on the cost of the property. So mm. this is the trade-off in terms of consideration. Yeah. The only other consideration too is that rents can go up. Typically, they do go up a little bit every. Correct. Right. It's not a static number that stays, and we'll talk about that when we get there. All right. So the factors to consider if we're trying to get to home ownership, but you know that was sort of a graduated opening the door thing there. That's that was sort of the idea with that. So I don't know if it worked, but it sort of looks like the door is opening. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know if okay. these were like you know, is this a confessional or a toilet or what is the deal <laughs> all right so i was more thinking like an advent calendar you toilet oh, in terms oh, okay. of that you know but you know the whole that you know they have them with beer and wine now those advent calendars so oh do they okay yeah yeah, yeah. you can get you know one where you're opening a different bottle every single day it's very cool um so here's the things that the, the things that we want to be talking about the, the factors to consider the mortgage rates and the pricing trends what's going on right now your own personal financial goals, and then housing prices and recession risk that's upcoming. So, you know, when we talk about this, you know, the mortgage rates and price trends, right? So, yeah, you know, it just happened literally as of yesterday, the 30 year fixed, the average price, the average number went over seven, 7.08% as of yesterday. Yeah, I'm seeing 7.473 as of today. Wow. See, even more, right? So that's the first time. 2020, 2002 was the last time they were over 7%. Crazy. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the whole thing is the Fed has been doing this tightening thing where they've been raising interest rates. That's all you've been hearing. That's all you've been hearing for us. We've been banging on that drum for a year now with the whole <laughs> raising the interest rates thing. But, and we told you, they literally told you a year ago. So Craig and I were, were, were trumpeting and blasting this horn last October to tell everybody who was looking to buy at that particular time that you had better lock in your rates before the end of last year because this was going to happen because one of the first instruments that gets affected by interest rate increases is mortgage rates. 
Mm-hmm. The Fed does not control it, but the 10-year Treasury and the interest rate rise directly impacts, and it's the first thing to happen. The projection for next year is that we are possibly either by the end of this year, and you just said 7.43, right? We're closing in on that. Eight, yeah, right? yeah. So I mean, the projection is that it's 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 will peak somewhere over eight, mm-hmm. and then probably stay in the like mid five range, like little set a little find a bottom, but it'll be somewhere like five and a half mm-hmm. next year through the whole year. Like, you know, so if you're looking at uh, taking a mortgage, you know, that would be the conversation would be more to wait here because right now you're going to be in the eights. Yeah. I think every, everything comes with wins and losses, right? And I don't know how much you want to get into it on this slide, but I'm looking at if the interest rates are up in the eights, what happens to the price of the home? usually drops right 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 and you're going into for the new england area the slower uh real estate season anyway so with a high rate and you know slower season you might find yourself more in a buyer's position or if you can get the right price on the property you can always refinance when the rates go down well that's true you can always refinance you just realize that that with a higher rate with a lower amount you're going to end up paying more on the note out over time if you don't, right. that's right. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, so you can, you just, you know, depending on the situation, you just might restart it. But, you know, this one, we get into the next one. And I have no idea why I left this slide in here. So uh-huh. I'm going to sort of just bop right through it real quick because I don't know why it was supposed to, it wasn't supposed to be in there. Rochester. But this, Rochester. Yeah, yeah, Rochester. We, really like yes, Rochester. How bad Rochester was in terms of the, the equity, the housing market. That's what we were trying to do. Ah, okay. <laughs> So it, this gets to that point, Craig, exactly what you were talking about with your own personal goals. Like, like how long do you plan to stay in that home? Mm-hmm. We, if it's a starter home or the, you know, the, the, the upgrade to the second home, like how long are you going to plan to stay there? Because that sort of gets into that conversation of, am I going to refi? And if I refi, can I just, I'll refi again and just start a new 30 at a lower number because I know I'm going to sell the house in three or four years if I, you know, in going through that. And so that sort of becomes some of that conversation again, that, you know, uh, why do you want to own your own home? You know, I think that sort of gets to, you know, we talk a lot about the why people do things. Mm -hmm. What, why is it important? Right. What does home ownership mean to you? Right. Is it, you know, you want to, you want, a place to live and that's where you're going to raise your family or you want to retire there and that's where you're going to stay or is it a temporary situation here's this is good enough for now and i just want to build equity um are you buying and selling homes you know right. what is it look more as an investment you know what is your like you said objective what's your what's the why yeah and as we you know in the next not the next one because again i had the same problem there in terms of with the slides i don't know what i was doing but We'll have fun with that. Uh, but, you know, talking about because some of this specifically for the next year or as you go forward with this, because one of the things where people get into trouble is it's all great when everything is going well. But what happens if the economy tightens? What happens if there's a job loss? If you're a two income family, what if one of you isn't working? Right. Are you able to sort of navigate and continue to pay that mortgage if that happens? Mm hmm. And I think this is where a lot of people get into trouble is they think, you know, it's unfortunately for Craig and I, we shine the light on the doom and gloom, the dark corner and things a lot of times when we're doing this, but it's, it's purposely done because you have to have this conversation. What happens if you're in a two come two income family and everything's all hunky dory. If one of you isn't working, can you still maintain that lifestyle? Yeah, I think another reason there was such an issue back in 2008, 2009 is because people were being qualified for these mortgages that were way over what they probably should be paying. They were buying a lot more house than they could actually afford. It actually became, you know, house poor because all the money is being dumped into making mortgage payments. So I think you want to be cognizant of, you know, we talk about budgeting and what percentage of your budget should go towards home ownership or, you know, um, for for, uh, housing. And you want to just stay in in that same budget, whether you're buying the home or renting the home. Because you right, want to actually take all of that. Sorry, just didn't mean to cut you off there because no. it's actually taking into consideration like all the debt. Right. Mm-hmm. So so again, this gets back to the whole debt thing. 
like the debt shouldn't go beyond, you know, that, that like 30 to 35% range, regardless of what the debt is on. Yeah, you know, the home, the car, the, the credit cards, a student loan, whatever it is, like, like, that's the thing. And I think that's, Craig, you, you know, you're hitting right on it with that, with, with that a lot of people, it's like, well, okay, but yeah, my student loan is something else, or my car is something else. This is my house, so I can go to 30% on my house, but then you've got, you know, another 15% that you're spending between student loans and your car, that's 45% of your income. Right. No matter who you are, if you're Elon Musk, you have a limited re- amount of resources, right? He could, he could buy Canada, but he probably couldn't afford to keep it for very long. I mean, <laughs> it's just the same thing here. You know, you can go out and buy a mansion, but the issue is once you start paying upkeep, cost of mortgage, all the other things that come into that, if you did, like you said, hit a rut in the road, do you, are you covered for that emergency? Can you get through that downturn when you have that expensive debt over your head? And that's where people get hung up, right? Right. Well, I should have it. This is my dream home. I should, it doesn't matter what it costs. So, okay. <laughs> well, and I know, and you know, and some of that is the flip side of the whole idea of, of, and again, this gets into the, the sort of the, the two prongs going that the, uh, the idea is I'm building wealth, right? Home ownership equals building wealth. That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm building up wealth by having this home and, then there's that that side that's the the renting side that says, well, that's just it's a losing game because you I've got to do all this upkeep, I got to keep all this, I got to pay all this other stuff, insurance and utility, you know, and everything else that goes along with that that's dragging me down. And what happens if I have this downturn? I can't afford to pay for it anymore. Well, bu- building wealth is a risk return type proposition, right? So how much risk do you want to take for a much return? Yeah. Like said, if you're putting all your money into this property, hoping it's going to be the big payoff and something goes wrong, well, you've got all your eggs in that, literally in that one basket or that one house. So right. building wealth should be, you know, a balance based on what your risk tolerance is, regardless of the investment you're putting it in, whether it's real yeah. estate, whether it's Robin Hood, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> matter. And like you said, like that's that I think was what it was one of the factors that occurred back in 08, 09 with the housing bubble is that there was all of this like, oh, no, no, you can afford that. Look, the rates are at, you know, one and a half, like, you know, no big deal. Well, the mortgage brokers took the brakes off. So they didn't care if you could afford to keep the house. They only cared that they were getting paid on the mortgages they were writing. Right. <laughs> so we're going to bop through this one real quick because we don't need that. All right. So, you know, the the future housing trends and and recession risk, right? So as as we sort of talked about there, you know, uh, there's certain areas of the country right now that that are already in a recession. The housing market is already in a recession. You mean like that, Florida? You know, yeah. Well, so, you know, to, to <laughs> certain places like that where it's just the 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 valuations have started to drop dramatically. That and you know the the idea is that this is probably going to follow you know with the rest of the country into 2023 essentially. But you know housing has grown dramatically like you talked about it was on fire in terms of everything that was happening but the country itself the economic recession is definitely hanging over everybody's shoulder right now right it's it's you know are we going to go into one the warning signs are there it's flashing red we talked about this in a previous one the recession is coming we talked about it you know so and what happens there is that's where that tightening comes in, where the economy tightens, where those are job losses and, and, and furloughs and layoffs and cutbacks and all of that stuff happens. So if that's the case, as Craig just mentioned, maybe so, this is some you know downturn occurring where pricing values might come down. I just don't know how much they're going to come down. Like, 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 I don't see this being a big number coming down. Yeah, I think the problem, you know, like we've talked about, Tom, you know, on air and off the air quite a few times is the fact that a lot of the indicators that are typical solid indicators aren't, aren't normal the last five to 10 years. And I think the same is going on right now where we've talked to some people and, you know, they've got hundreds of positions open at their company. And then I talked to another person just two days ago and, you know, they had 500 positions get cut. So it's just like everybody's waffling trying to figure out what the next move is and no one knows. And so it's really difficult. Even when, like I said, you have some red flags go up there, typical indicators, 
But on the other side, you have record low unemployment and people are, you know, cost of living increases along with social security cost of living increases like 8% this year, yeah. which is kind of unheard of. So you have like these really like back and forth, who knows, you can you make the argument either way at this point. No, and that's, that's part of it. It, it is quite the unknown and nobody, and, and at this point, again, every indicator says the Fed is going to raise interest rates again next week. We don't know how much. And, and that's a fact, you know, when you start looking at this, where inflation is and where these numbers are, like that's where this could tick right over 8% on the interest, you know, on a mortgage rate very, very quickly. And, and, you know, if you're paying for a home today, I, you know, there could be a drop next year, 2024 of say five to 10%. I don't think you're going to see more than that. I don't think you're going to see the craziness that happened in 08, 09 type of thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, this comes back to a little bit more of, and this sort of gets to the whole, you know, point of all of this, right? Should I buy now or should I wait, right? That was the, the whole idea of this, you know, and ultimately whether you rent or you buy often comes down to just all those practical considerations like we talked about, like, like, uh, you know, I have you started a family. And so the place you're living in is, is just not accommodating the family type of thing, you know, is the lease up. Right. And, and, you know, who are we talking to? We're just talking to somebody who, who rented a place was renting a place. They tried to purchase it. Somebody else bought it. And literally like two months later, doubled the rent. I don't remember that conversation. I had it with somebody. I was, I was just, I I you were in on it. Oh yeah. God bless. Who knows? You know, but, but it was like a situation like that where, where, yeah, the lease is up. So I've got to do something. I got to, you know, so if it's one of those situations, you know, it might be like Craig said, you know, find a place that works for you and you can always refinance. Um, the sort of two sides to that though, you know, if you enter into a lease agreement right now, right, it's usually a year, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think too many places are doing the whole month to month thing anymore nowadays. Yeah, I don't know. I guess it depends. You know, it's, it's all over the place, right? Right. Um, I think the big thing too, Tom, is what we talk about. Whenever you're making a large purchase like this, you got to try to take the emotion out of it, right? The issue isn't, you know, why are you buying, but why are you buying right now? Right. Right. And if you're buying in an up market, like we just, everybody's, why would anybody have been buying the last two years when the market was in, on fire, right? Because it's a total seller's market. Why would anybody be buying? Well, because they're getting two, three percent interest rates. That's why they were locking in their payments they could afford. Didn't matter what the cost of the property was because they were going to keep it over a long period of time. Well, if that's the case, then there's no bad time to buy. Right. If right exactly. now, you know, right? If the interest rates are on, on fire right now, they're going up through the roof. Then you go, well, should I not buy now? Well, well prices are sinking. So if they're, if they're hitting an all time top with an interest rate that's on the mortgages, but you know later you could always refinance, once again, how long are you going to keep the property for? You know, if you're only going to keep it for a year, not a great idea. If you're going to keep it on a long term and could refinance at some point, you know, that depends on what you're getting into for your down payment. Do you have PMI, all these other factors, but it depends on the why. So the bigger part is the emotion. You don't want to be overpaying or buying a property on emotion because then you'll always make a bad decision because you want emotions more important than the factors. And that's the true with everything. And that's part of what we do here. And that's part of, the, of our mission, right? Is trying to help everyone sort of have that clear vision of the road ahead. You're sort of, as Craig said, taking that emotion out of where you're trying to get to so that you can see it a little bit easier. Maybe I should have fog on the road where then when the fog clears away and then we can say that's how we get to the clear vision of the road ahead. Then we I have to be driving through England, England, though. It's always foggy in England. It's always foggy here. Yesterday, the last two days, trying to drive on the road, it was extremely oh, foggy. First thing in the there. morning, maybe. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. It was, you couldn't see anything. So <laughs> one of the things we offer, right, for anybody is is to have a conversation. You know, let, let's let's set up a time to chat. Let's talk about you you know, what your goals are and really what's most important to you today. That's what we want to do. You can see that the, the link is there. Um, there's also the, the, the QR code. You can just scan the QR code. It'll bring you right to the scheduler, you know, set up a time. We're happy to have a chat with you and just talk about what's important to you and what really makes sense in your world and how we can sort of help you figure that out. You got everything there, but the, that was easy button. 
Yeah, yeah, no. It's if I could have put the easy button in, I would have. So, so we 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 keeping the the think with a the drink theme going. What's on tap coming up? So next week, you know, this it it's, it doesn't say retired. It says re retire. It's like Tom Brady. He re retired. 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 So this is our spooktacular event. Since this is very very scary thought. What if you retired this year? So it was either going to be this week or next week because Halloween falls on the Monday. So it was like literally right in between the two. So I'm like, well, we'll do it next week. The sort of the scary version, which is on 11.3. What if you retired this year? On 11.10, yeah. On 11.10, we have a special guest. We have financial literacy for women with the executive director from Women's Money Matters. This is a great episode for anybody who's especially women and talking about finances. And then on 11.17, you know, since all of this has gone on this year and everything has happened, you know, some of the conversations is, should I be worried about my 401k or what should I be doing with my retirement plan is what we'll be covering in that. Well, that's gonna Greg, be any fun. questions in the chat box for us? No, I have no questions in the chat box at this time. Everybody's okay, out so, by the house. Yeah, no, oh. yeah. <laughs> we're, we're going to find the next chocolate stout, basically. Oh, yes. There you go. So if you do ever have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to us. You can go to the website. Again, it's www.ariesfoundation.org. Uh, on there's a contact us thing. You can send us an email. It's info at ariesfoundation.org. Uh, and lastly, there, the QR code, you can just scan that, schedule a time. We're happy to have a conversation with you. And on that, I'm going to say thanks and have a great evening.